Today we are starting a brand new series that we are calling Foundations, Building for the Future on the Legacy of the Past. And here's what's really special about these next four weeks. For the next four weeks, we are going to be celebrating the church's anniversary, the first Sunday in December. I know we look super fresh and young, but Calvary is 70 years old. Isn't that awesome? And we celebrate all that God has done. We are gonna have that Sunday, December 5th, we're gonna have a big birthday party and you are not gonna wanna miss it. Um, On the first Sunday in December, 1951, five families met in an upstairs storefront on Facet Street in East Toledo and they said there are too many lost people in Toledo and not enough churches and we feel God leading us to do something about it. And for the last seven decades, God has worked, and we'll, we'll look at this over the next couple of weeks, God has worked to bring life change to people in so many different ways, and uh, we want to celebrate that. Um, each week, we're going to talk a little bit about of our history and things that we're going to do, and I have been looking forward to this series because it's going to be fun, just kind of celebrate what God has done, where he's taking us in the future, what our foundations are as a church, and how God wants to build on those things. So with all of that, I've been stoked, I've been looking forward to today because I was ready to bring a hype message, a pep talk. We were going to celebrate. And then I felt the Lord say, yeah, right? Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter five. Hebrews chapter five. If you know this passage of scripture, you probably already would guess this isn't a pep talk. (laughs) It's one of those passages of scripture that I'm just so convinced that Even though it's not festive, it's what God would have us look at today. So we're going to take the next few moments and just kind of walk through. In fact, I want to let the scripture do the work for us today, kind of do the heavy lifting. So we're going to read through uh, kind of Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, through the 12th verse of chapter 6, and kind of look at some things there that we're going to see, give you a little bit of a backstory on the book of Hebrews, and talk to you about why this is really important. I believe the church as well as our church, is in a really unique kind of crossroads moment. Our culture is changing, is it not? And spiritually, there's so many challenges that come to us as as people, let alone as kind of followers of Jesus. And so it's important for us to recognize those seasons where we go, there's something unique that's happening. There's something different that's happening, and the church needs to be aware of that. And I think that this book of Hebrews really helps us to consider that. Here's a little backstory on it. We don't know who wrote it, which is kind of unique to other books in the New Testament. Like many books in the New Testament are named after the people who wrote them. We know that Peter wrote the letters, first and second Peter. We know that John wrote his epistles. We know that Luke wrote his gospel. So many of the books that Paul writes, he says right at the very beginning, I, Paul, wrote this. The book of Hebrews, we don't know. It kind of has echoes of Paul's theology, so we figured that whoever wrote it was at least influenced by Paul. It, 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 some people speculate that it might have been Apollos, a, a guy who is a character in the book of Acts. Some people actually think that it was, was Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke, that maybe he was the one that wrote this as well. But the bottom line is, it doesn't say. No, nobody says, I wrote this, so we really don't know who it was. We, we can guess, but we don't know. We also don't know exactly who he wrote it to, because the book doesn't say to the church in Ephesus or to the church in Corinth. There's there's no geography given. We speculate, we're we're fairly certain that it was written to a church in Rome from some of the things that are said and the historical references. So we think it might have been to believers, to Christians, who were a part of a church in Rome. But for anything else, we have to be detectives. Like We have to kind of look at the details, the, the little hints that we get throughout the book and kind of guess who the book is written to. And some of you go, I really don't care, right? But here's why it's important. We believe that the book was written to Jewish Christians in the city of Rome. How do we know this? Well, because the author makes all kinds of references back to the Jewish scriptures, back to the Old Testament. He talks a lot about Moses. He talks about angels. He talks about the law. He talks about covenants. He talks about creation. And in mentioning all those things, those are things that someone with a Jewish religious background would understand. Like he's pulling on their knowledge, which tells us he's writing this to church people, which if you would consider yourself a a church person, whether for a long time or just for a couple of weeks, 
If you'd consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, who's a, who's a person that's a part of the body of Christ, knowing that he wrote this to church people should get your attention. It should cause you to say, there's something he's saying here that I should pay attention to. The other thing that's really interesting is we believe that he wrote it to a church that was seeing members of the church walk away from their faith. Like, we're not exactly sure how or why, but when you read it, there's this tone that's there that some of the believers have turned back to Judaism. Some of the believers have actually just walked away from faith altogether. And there is a constant pool, like a constant temptation on those in the church to do the same. And the author of Hebrews is saying, hold on to your commitment. Stand firm in your faith even when people around you seem to be walking away from it. And honestly, that should get our attention because presently, I feel like we live in a, in a season of time where our faith is constantly under assault and attack. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Like if it's not in the things you believe, it's the way that you live. I don't say that to be a victim or, or pessimistic. I say that because Jesus said we would have trouble. Like that is there. But what's interesting is it's kind of cool right now. It's kind of cool to deconstruct your faith. It's kind of cool to kind of rip apart the things you believe. Now look, I'll tell you, it's important to seek after truth, yes? But not at the expense of saying, I don't have any space to believe in my life. Like faith is critical to who we are and how we believe. And in a world that is deconstructing its faith, a letter written to people saying to them, hold on to your commitment, seems pretty relevant to us today, doesn't it? So I want to share with you just, a, just a, a little portion of the book of Hebrews today, which, think of this, is being written to a church in a culturally challenging time where the author is saying to them, hold on to your faith. It seems to make sense that our ears should perk up and we should pay attention. And so we're going to look at a little bit of this scripture today. Now let me quote something to you that I don't, I haven't double checked this, but I'm pretty sure it's not in the Bible. Have you ever heard the phrase, if the shoe fits. Anybody ever heard that? Is it in the Bible? Anybody help me out here? Okay, good. I, <laughs> that, was a, that was a trick question. Okay, so it's not in the Bible, but it's, it's popular, right? If you trace it back, the first time we see that kind of in literature in the United States goes back to the 1800s, where it's something written about a politician, and the comment was made, if the shoe fits, finish it for me, <laughs> wear it, right? You know that phrase. Actually, they can trace it back to the 1500s in England, where a similar phrase was used, if the cap fits, wear it. Why we went from head to toe, I have no idea, right? But you know that phrase. We use it oftentimes, especially if we want to say something uncomfortable to somebody. Instead of just saying, that sounds like you to me, we get away with saying, well, <laughs> if the shoe fits, and then we don't even finish it. We just kind of leave it hanging out there. We're going to look at a passage of scripture today, and if the shoe fits, are you picking up what I'm laying down? First five chapters of the book of Hebrews, he just, he's a theologian. He just comes at us with this great theology about the church, about God, about Jesus, about what he's done for us, and it is verse after verse after verse, and if you're not careful, what happens to me is I kind of get lost in it, because it is so rich. He is this master theologian who is unpacking these deep spiritual truths for us that go back to the Old Testament that points out that Jesus is the best thing that could ever happen to us. And then he does this all the way up through verse 10 of chapter five. And then when he gets to chapter seven, verse one, he picks right back up with his theology. He just, he's a masterful theologian. But what's interesting is that verse 11 of Hebrews chapter five, it's like he stops for a moment. He kind of takes a little break. He takes a sip from his coffee cup. You ask me, well, Chad, how do you know he was drinking coffee? What's the name of the book? <laughs> Hebrews, duh. <laughs> You're welcome. It was actually a literary device in the first century that if you wanted to get somebody's attention, you'd make a quick left turn. Like, like you'd, you'd show them something they didn't expect. And in the middle of this, all this theology, 
the author of the book of Hebrews just kind of stops for a minute. And then we get Hebrews chapter five, verse 11. He says, we have much to say about this. This theology, this richness, who Jesus is, how he changes your life, how it changes how you live in the world. We've got so many good things to say to you. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. I read that, and it was like a punch in the gut. Because he doesn't say, it's hard to make it clear to you because I'm running out of time. He doesn't say that. I've done that on Sundays. You're like, you haven't had enough time? You took all the time. Anyways, yeah. He doesn't say, it's hard to make it clear to you because you're no longer able, able to understand it. He doesn't talk about their perception. You know what he says? He says, it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. And when I read that the other day, I just, I, you, you kind of get a sense about these things. I just knew that's what I was supposed to talk about today. And I literally in my notes wrote, God, do I have to do this? Because when somebody says something like that to you, it's, it's a little bit harsh, isn't it? You, you know that the English language is not what the New Testament was written in. It was originally written in Greek. So we've had groups of people over the years that translate that into other Bible translations. And so you get different perspectives on what that means. The word that's there has the idea where, where it says you no longer try to understand. It has the idea of you're, you're slow to listen. Like you're, you're just kind of, you're not hearing this. Here's another version of it from the New Living Translation. There's much more we'd like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. Well, good morning, Sunday, doesn't it? <laughs> Wow. All right, let's, let's make that just a little nicer. English Standard Version. About this we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. That's a little easier to take, isn't it? Just as harsh. And then there's the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, that says we have a great deal to say about this. And it's difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. Well, that's nice. Now you know why I wrote in my Bible or the, my notes, do I have to do this? Do I have to say this to lazy people? <laughs> What's that mean? Well, it's, it's the idea where he uses the word slow there. It's not the idea of naturally slow. Do you know anybody who's naturally slow? I had an uncle who just had one speed and it was about 50 below mine. Just, he was just naturally slow. You know those people because you've been behind them in the grocery store. You've been behind them in the airport. They think the speed limit when it says 55 is 35 and it tests the fruit of the spirit in your life. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like there's some people, they're just naturally slow. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about a slowness that kind of is a choice. Basically, you've allowed yourself to get lazy and it's kind of a natural thing that happens. I mean, I'll just be real honest. It used to be that every time my phone rang, I picked it up and I sprung to answer it. Now, I, I sometimes just don't care and I definitely check the number to see if I know who it is. Anybody else? It used to be that if my doorbell rang, I was running to the door. Now, when the doorbell rings, I just go, eh, we must have ordered something. Anybody else? I'll get it later. It's just somebody dropping something off. It used to be that every time she said, honey, will you get that for me? He couldn't move fast enough to get it. And then over time, when she says, hey, can you get this for me? He says, yeah, at a commercial. Anybody? <laughs> if you're a parent, you know what I mean. When you say to your child, hey, can you, can you, yeah, 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 I'll get it later. I'll get it later when you kind of deliberately choose to just kind of be slow about something, you kind of just put it off. And the author of the book of Hebrews says to these folks, you've, you've become that way spiritually. And then he unpacks it a little bit more for them. Look, look at what he says in verse 12, Hebrews chapter five, verse 12. In fact, he says, Though by this time you ought to be teachers, like by this time you should be the one who's leading others. At this time, you should be the one who's helping others to see how to live out their faith. You should be the one who's encouraging others and strengthening them. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, 
You need someone to teach you the elementary truths, not the middle school, high school, university, or graduate level stuff. You, you need someone to teach you the basics, the elementary truths of God's word all over again. It's like you've been held back. Like, like you, you keep having to go through the, the same stuff over and over again. You need milk, not solid food. Well, what's he referring to there? Well, if you've ever had a, had a child, you know the process, Right? Because at first, it's just milk or formula. And then eventually, it's that nasty, smushy stuff. Do you know what I mean? And then eventually, they get to solid food. It's a process. And he says, you ought to be enjoying steak and baked potatoes. Can I get an amen for that right now? But instead, you're still sucking on the bottle. You're still just a spiritual baby. And there's so much more. You should be further along. You're just staying there in that same place. Look, I I don't mean this as a guilt trip. I I don't think the author of Hebrews did either. But I have an honest question for you. When you hear that about you should be, but you are, my question is, I guess the statement may be, if the shoe fits, wear it. And if there was ever a time that it's good to think about that, it's probably now. And I know we, we, can, we can beat this drum to death right now. But over the last two years, we've probably had more opportunity to become spiritually apathetic than any other time that I can remember. Not at first. When, when things first kind of shut down last March, last April, we were all gonna be better people. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because you were like, I'm going to work out. I'm going to learn how to crochet. I'm going to make sourdough bread. I'm going to do it all, right? That's what you were going to do. And then things just kind of trudge on. And some of the things that were probably there anyways kind of come to the surface in our lives. And we're tired and we're frustrated. And in the midst of all of this, one of the first places that has been easy for many of us to become, well, Dull, slow, lazy. It's probably been in our spiritual lives. Again, not a guilt trip. Just what I've seen in my own life as a fact. So if the shoe fits, well, here's what he says. Let's go back to it. Hebrews chapter five, verse 13. He says, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. If, if your child is, is currently on milk and then there comes a time for them to move on to solid food, but all you ever give them is milk, what's that gonna do to the health and life of your child? It's not gonna develop, is it? But he, says, he says, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. He says, look, here's the challenge for us. For many of us, we've stayed stuck in this one place and God is calling you to take those next steps and move forward. Not to just be stuck in that place, but calling you to step up, to raise the bar to something better in how you live your spiritual life. And the reality is many of us have just been content to be where we've always been spiritually. Like, like we're pretty sure we're gonna get into heaven So we've got the fire insurance policy. And then beyond that, well, whatever happens, happens. And what he's saying here is if you're no different than you used to be, if there's not something that differentiates you from the world around us, because you know that the scripture says that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you should be different. You know that, right? Help me out. You know that, right? Does it say weird? Some of you take note of that. Doesn't say weird, but it does say different. (laughs) If you're not getting closer to who God wants you to be, if you're having a hard time distinguishing what's good and what's evil, like making good decisions in your life, then maybe it's a moment, well, if the shoe fits, to go, is that me? Like, have I become lazy, dull, slow in my faith? Why take the time to talk about it? Because if it is you, are you missing out? God's got so much more. Like, like imagine, 
Imagine that somebody is given a season pass to Disney World. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Disney World. You know what I'm talking about. Anybody? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, a lot of us have worshiped there. Okay, so, so you, you know what I'm talking about. So if you've been there, right? So let's say you get a season pass, and you go, and you get out of the parking lot there in Orlando, and you realize someone's going to come with a tram with a little shuttle to pick you up because you're parking about eight miles from the place, right? So you get in the little cart with the little tram, and they run you up to the front gate, and you're like, this is awesome, I'm staying on this, and they take you back to the parking lot, and then they run you up to the front gate, and then they take you back to the parking lot, and you spend the whole day just riding the shuttle in the parking lot. And you're like, I love Disney World! Like, this is awesome! And you're like, you're missing it, and they're like, no, I'm at Disney! And you're like, yeah, but there's so much more on the other side of that gate. Like, like you, you may have gotten in the kingdom, but you're missing all the magic. Like, like, it's on the other side of this thing. And if you're content to be there, like, I know a lot of people who are just content to go, look, I'm going to heaven and I checked the box. I watched online. I made it to church on Sunday. I'm, I'm okay. But if you've never let scripture become a regular part of your life, if you don't find yourself talking to God about everyday things, if you're not connecting in the local church, if you're not serving in some way, if you're not involved in what God's doing, if all you're doing is just content to just ride the shuttle back and forth between here and heaven until the time comes, man, are you missing out on so much? And he's saying, look, there is so much more that he does not want us to miss. Not a guilt trip. I'm just saying to you, if the shoe fits, he, he takes it another step. Hebrews chapter six, verse one. He says, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation. See, that's important, not laying again. He's saying, look, he's not saying foundations aren't important. Foundations are critically important, are they not? That's why we call this series, things we're gonna look at in the next couple weeks, foundations. Like if you're not building on a good foundation, you're not building in a good way. Like, like, you need to have a foundation. Most of the time something gets messed up in my life is because I've ignored the foundations. Anybody else? But what he's saying is, if you're in a process of laying that foundation and then kind of tearing it up and laying it again and kind of tearing it up and you keep going back to the same things over and over and over again because you're never moving beyond where you started, then that's a wake-up call. And he says, let's not lay again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and a faith in God. What are those two things? Repentance is turning from your sin. That's what we talked about last week, right? Repentance is turning from your sin and turning to faith in God. Like, like you're making that, that switch. You're, you're turning from the way you were going and you're, you're walking, you're moving to God. Like that's a, that's a basic. But when I keep having to come back and repent over and over again for the same sins, when I keep wrestling with my faith in a way that honestly, I probably should have been past maybe a couple of years ago, if I've been content just sitting here and never move beyond some of the basics, what else does he say? Well, look at what he says in the next verse. He says, you move on to past instruction about cleansing rites, what's that? Well, we're not in the first century Jewish church, but the idea of cleansing rites was baptism. So like if you've not yet been baptized, December 5th, we would love to have you join in that celebration that day. The instruction about cleansing rites and the laying on of hands. What is that? That's not a fist fight. Laying on of hands was something in the first century church that when someone was commissioned to serve in some way, the leadership in the church would lay hands on them and commission them to serve. So someone who has taken those steps of baptism and beginning to use their gifts to serve in some way, isn't that the very beginnings of our faith? Like those are the first steps we should take. And not laying the foundation again of the resurrection of the dead isn't the fact that we believe there's life after this life, our whole hope, anybody? And eternal judgment, well, that's cheery. Unless you know the judge and you know that he's made everything right. So he says these beginning things and then the resurrection and eternal judgment, that's the end. He says, look, lay that foundation from beginning to end and then don't tear it up again, build on it. Like, move forward. And I love verse three, because he says, and God permitting, we will do so. That's what we're gonna do. That's why I'm excited about this series, because I am thrilled to share with you what God has done in the last 70 years of this church. But I don't for a minute think that our best days are behind us. Anybody? <laughs> like, I believe God has 
greater things than we've ever seen in store as we use his gifts, his people, his power to see him at work in our community, in our families, in our homes, in our world. Like there's things that God wants to do and God permitting, we're gonna do it. And I love that little pep talk that he does there. And then, I don't know if this happened or not, but this is what I see. He puts his pen down, he picks up his coffee cup, because you know he likes coffee. And he takes a little sip. And then he jumps into one of the trickiest passages in all of scripture. There are like whole books that you can buy about hard sayings of the Bible. And this one is near the very top. Hebrews chapter six, verse four. It is impossible, remember that word. It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. All these things he's saying, look, someone who has had a very genuine life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ, he says it is impossible for them. And then we see it says, and if they who have fallen away, what does that mean? That they've then rejected that faith. It is impossible for them to be brought back to repentance to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. When I read the words, it is impossible to be brought back to repentance, I find that terrifying. Anybody else? Like not only is it one of the trickiest passages in scripture, it's one of the most frightening passages in scripture. And if you wanna make a list of the passages in scripture that people fight over, it's at the top of the list too. Like there have been thousands of pages written on who's right and who's wrong about this thing. Like you've probably heard people use phrases like backslidden and you've heard them use terms like once saved, always saved. You've heard people talk about falling away and you've heard other people talk about eternal security and you get, you get all these arguments that come up. And the reality is there's all kinds of theological questions that I honestly, I don't wanna talk to you about today. <laughs> Because we could get caught up in the argument. I just, I just want you to get the sense of what the author of Hebrews is saying. What he's saying is, I'm telling you all this about not being spiritually lazy because I don't want that to happen to you. He says, look, it is possible that someone can so turn their back on God that their heart can become so cold that they can be so far from him so apostate that they find themselves in a place where it is impossible for them to come back. That, to me, is terrifying. It almost, when you read it, can put you in a place where it's easy to give up hope. But if it was hopeless... I don't think he would have told them about it. Like there's a reason he's saying this to them. He wants them to see what's happening to people around them and trying to encourage them to better things, to give them hope, even in the midst of this. And so when he drops something so heavy on them, he then goes to say this. He gives them a little word picture. He says, land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. I'll sign up for the blessing of God. Anybody else? Like, this is a good picture. But then he says in verse eight, he says, but land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end... It will be burned. Here's what he says. Land that produces nothing but weeds will face nothing but fire. Church, he says, take a look at your life. What fruit are you producing? What's coming out of your heart? Because if it's just spiritually dull, 
you can find yourself in a place where you're not moving forward. That's a terrifying place to be. Anybody ever been in a lazy river? Do you know what I'm talking about? You go to, you go to some place that got a lazy river and you get in that thing and all you gotta do is like sit in a little tube or whatever and it just moves you along, which is great if you're you know, lazy and <laughs> it's great if that's the direction you wanna go in but if that's not the direction you wanna go in, at some point you gotta get out of the tube and you gotta start walking in the other direction and you gotta realize you're going against the current. Does that make sense? Like I've been in one of those things and then missed the place where I wanted to get out of that thing and then I have to jump out of that thing and then I have to walk backwards in that thing and it's work to get out when you have to move against the current. Anybody? Like I believe that it, it feels like to me that I live in a world where the current is pulling me away from where God would have me to be. Anybody else? Like that's biblical. It's not just our world, it's the world. Maybe a better analogy is sometimes I feel like I wanna get up there, so I go up the escalator, but it's actually an escalator that's going down. Anybody ever tried that, to go up and down escalator? This is a lot of fun. They'll kick you out of the place if you try it. But I've done it. And it can be done. Like you, you can go up a down escalator, you gotta take some big steps, you gotta move fast, you gotta push slow people out of the way. <laughs> Feels kinda good, actually. But you, you do that, it's the only way you're gonna get up there. But if you stop and you just stand still, recognize what's naturally gonna happen. You're gonna go back down. And this is what he's saying. He's saying, look, look at the fruit in your life. Because if there is a current, if there is a pool, if there is a movement everywhere around you that is pulling you back and you just stop, you're never truly standing still. It's not that you're not just moving forward, it's that you're actually going backwards. And if you ignore this and you keep going backwards, he says, church, I'm warning you, you can somehow find yourself in a place where it's impossible for you to come back. Chad, I don't believe that because I'm, I'm eternally secure. So am I. I know what Jesus did for me, and I have eternal security. But this scripture tells me that that doesn't mean that I'm secure eternally. I know what Jesus did for me, but I also know what my evil heart can do to me. And if I just think I can just stand still, I could find myself in a place that I do not want to be, which leaves some of you who are watching this, or sitting in this building, I know what's gonna happen, because it happens every time you talk about this. As soon as this service is done, you're gonna turn off that screen, and you're gonna go, it's me. Like, that's me. That passage of scripture, I sinned one too many times. Some of you are gonna get in your car, and before you can pull out of the parking lot, you're gonna hear a voice in your head that says, well, that's you. You might as well give up because you've messed up so many times. Nobody knows it, but you've messed up so many times that it's impossible for you to come back. And can I tell you something? That is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's the voice of an enemy who wants you to give up. I can tell you this, if you're worried that it is you, then it's not you. Because if it was you, you would be so apostate, you would be so dark, you would be so lost, you would have so rejected Jesus that you'd be back there and just wouldn't even care. But if you hear a voice in your head that says, I think it's me, that voice is the enemy trying to dissuade you. And what you need to hear is the voice of the Holy Spirit who is calling you home and saying he wants things to be right with you. This is the point of why the author of Hebrews even brings this up. Because watch what he says. This is, this is heavy stuff. Now you know why I wrote in my notes. Do I have to do this? But then he says this. Look at verse nine, Hebrews chapter six, verse nine. He says, even though we speak like this, even though we are dropping some heavy stuff on you, dear friends, there's only one place in the book of Hebrews where this great theologian stops for a moment and refers to the church as dear friends, beloved, people that I care about, my family that I love. At this point, he says to them, even though I'm putting such heavy stuff on you, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case 
The things that have to do with salvation. Anybody cool with better things? I'll sign up for better things. I'm happy for better things. I've had, I can name probably five, six people in my life, whether they ever said it or not, I knew that when they looked at me, they went out of their way to help me because they saw better things in my life than I did. They spoke life to me. They gave opportunity to me. They believed in me. And the author of the book of Hebrews is saying to the church, the dear friends that he loves, I believe for better things for you. And some of you need to realize you're missing out on the magic of the kingdom. That God has better things in store for you than where you are right now, just riding that shuttle back and forth. He has so much more. And if you got better things, sign me up. Ron and I went on vacation about, I don't know, it was about eight, nine years ago now. And uh, we were in the process of flying back. And I remember we were in the airport and we were, we were waiting, you know, it was just about time for them to board the plane. And, you know, they got the little loudspeakers that you can't hear. Do you know what I'm talking about in the airport? And all of a sudden they go, Gilligan party of two, please come to the desk. Gilligan party of two, please come to the desk. You know? And I'm like, well, this can't be good. Like, why are they calling us up there? And so we go walking up. I say, hey, we're Gilligan's. Chad? Yeah. Rhonda? Yeah. Well, it, it appears, Mr. and Mrs. Gilligan, that uh, we have a couple of extra seats in first class that are unclaimed, and we wondered if you would like to sit in them. And I said, I ain't falling for your tricks. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I said, yes, 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 before you change your mind, yes. We'll take your first class. I had not sat in first class before. I don't think I've sat in there since. And you get on the plane first in first class. Did you know this? Like they put you in and then you get to sit and they bring you something to eat and drink before the commoners get on. It's awesome. Like I'm sitting there kind of just drinking my little orange juice, you know, watching people come by and I'm like, hey, I got something here, loser. <laughs> you know, like you're just kind of in that place. Because you're back there. I got better things. It wasn't quite like that, but it was internally. Because if you'll tell me I can have better things, I'll sign up. Anybody else? So God says in his word, there are better things, dear friends. So don't stay stuck where you are. When there's a God who says, I've got better things for you. Can I tell you, some of you are in a place where for whatever reason, there are things that are weighing you down and you wonder, is there anything on the other side of this? And maybe even it's brought you to a place where you felt like you can't go any further or maybe there is no answer or there's no solution to where you're at. Look, if you're in that place, if the shoe fits, I want you to hold on to those two words. He believes in better things in your case. And today's the day for you to say, God, I don't see it right now, but I trust you. I put on those shoes of faith and I have faith, God, that you're gonna work this out. And others of you are saying, hey, that's good, Chad, because I've done that and I'm still waiting. Like, and I've been waiting and waiting and waiting and I'm tired because I've not seen what I've been waiting for yet. My faith has not been fulfilled yet and I'm weary. I was recently at an event where one of the Christian leaders that I just, I just, I truly respect this person was on a panel where they were interviewing some people and it was a weird question that they asked, but basically the question was, as you look to the future, what are you fearful of? And he, he looked at the person that asked the question and he says, I'm not fearful. He says, I'm just tired. I'm worn out. It has been a tough season and I honestly can tell you, this is one of the most visionary people I know. He says, I don't know what is ahead. And I'm weary and I'm tired. And that's what makes it tough right now. Anybody relate? When you find yourself in a place like that, when you find yourself in a place like that, Hebrews chapter six, verse 10. To the weary, he says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Some of you are wondering, God, where are you? 
And God, I'm doing everything I know to do and it doesn't seem like this thing is working out. And the author of Hebrews says, I know you're watching, everything's going on in the world around you and you're watching your friends go this way and you're watching other people receive this and that and you're watching all these things and I'm just telling you in what you're doing, God is not unjust and he's not gonna forget where you're at and what is going on in your life and in your world and you trust him in this place because he is going to work this out in your life and in my notes I wrote the words do not give up do not give up do not give up do not give up because some of you are in a place like they were in that church that the author of Hebrews is writing to and saying to you do not give up I'm supposed to be done in three minutes so I think all I'm going to do for the next three minutes is say that do not give up do not give up do not because no I got more to that there's there's things that some of you feel like, I don't know that I can do this. And God wants to say to you, have patience and trust me because I got better things in store. So this is the point where the author of Hebrews takes one last sip because it's getting cold. He says, I better bring this thing in for landing, verse 11. So if the shoe fits, We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for. Anybody ever hoped for anything? Were you ever a kid at Christmas? (laughs) And you write your little list and then you spend weeks, months hoping for something. Unfortunately, you knew it was coming on December 25th or at least there was an end date. Some of you are hoping for things. You don't know what the answer is. And he says, look, just just don't get slow in your faith so that what you hope for may be fully realized. Because this is what we want you to do if the shoe fits. And then he he says this, and if the shoe fits, verse 12 of Hebrews chapter six, he says, we do not want you to become lazy. There he goes again. (laughs) But to imitate those who through faith and patience, inherit what has been promised. I am fascinated by the 70 years that God has given this church. Because there are stories after stories after stories after stories of God's faithfulness and people who are willing to trust him. And the way that God worked and he blessed and he prospered this church in so many different seasons. And there's all kinds of great stories we can tell. And if I'm honest, there's some pretty nasty ones too. Because life's ups and downs, isn't it? And if you're new to Calvary, you might not know some of the stories of tough times financially and tough times in unity and tough times morally and things that go on during seasons and lives. But here's what I know. In every one of those seasons, God was faithful. And so I read that verse and I say, I don't want to become lazy, but I want to imitate those who led through these last 70 years, who believed through these last 70 years, who trusted in these last 70 years. And I don't want to just tell the stories. I want to live it for myself. For some of you, God is calling you to a deeper level of faith, to new things in your heart. There's something more and you know it. So if the shoe fits, they don't know for sure, but they speculate that the reason the image went from if the cap fits to the shoe fits, stick with me for a moment. (laughs) The reason they think that happened was because of the story of Cinderella. Isn't that crazy? It's a fairy tale and then Disney got a hold of it. But the whole thing was, what's the whole point of the story? The whole point of the story is they're looking for the person for whom the shoe fits, right? And if the shoe fits, then there's all kinds of blessings that come if you'll Put that glass slipper on. I have no interest in wearing a glass slipper, but you know what I mean. (laughs) So here's what I want to say to you today. That if somehow in this last little while the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart through what the author of Hebrews wrote 2,000 years ago, like if the shoe fits, then put it on. Because there are great blessings on the other side of that to inherit what he's promised. There's three words I just want to point out real quick and then we're going to pray. He's talking to those who are lazy. He's talking to those who need faith and he's talking to those who need patience. So that's who I want to pray for today. So will you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? 
And if you're watching this on TV or you're watching this online, you're listening to the podcast, I'm gonna ask that if the Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart, that you'll respond in some way by raising a hand, standing, uh, saying it to the person you're with. Like, like, don't let this go by without taking a moment. But I'm gonna ask you to just do something real simple. And let's start at the end with patience. If you've been believing for something, but you haven't seen it, and let's just say you're tired and you're weary, maybe even wondering if God knows who you are and what you're doing. And the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart and saying, have patience, dear friend. Like if that's you today, would you just stand right where you are and you would say, Holy Spirit, in this situation, help me to have patience. Like don't take a moment to hesitate. If you know that God's speaking to your heart, just stand right where you are. Then you know that that's something in your heart when you hear those words that God is not unjust, when you hear do not become weary in well-doing, you know that you've been waiting and you're doing it, maybe even wondering, God, are you even here and doing anything? Just stand right where you are and say, God, would you help me to have patience? Let's take it one more step. Maybe what you need today is faith, that there's something in front of you and you're just saying, God, I don't know how this is gonna work out and God, I don't know what you see that I can't see, but God, I have faith to believe for better things. If that's you, just stand right where you're at. You're gonna, you're gonna stand in faith today and say, God, in this situation for my kids, in this situation in my marriage, in this situation in my job, in this circumstance with my health, in this place where I am right now, Lord, I have faith to believe for better things. And I'm not gonna leave it right here. I'm not gonna let the current pull me away. With faith and patience, I stand right now. Let me take it one more step. And I, I'm not asking you if you are. Like, that's not the question. Because if that's the case, probably nobody would stand. But if the Spirit's been speaking to your heart and you would say, I don't want to be. Like, I don't want to be slow to hear. I don't want to be spiritually dull. I, I don't want to be lazy in my walk with God. And I could see where that escalator could pull me down and I don't wanna to go to that place. And you would say, God, help me not to be spiritually lazy. Would you just stand right where you are? If you just say, I don't wanna be. That's what the spirit of God has kind of been prompting you in this moment. I don't wanna be. I don't wanna find myself in that place. If you're standing, or even if you know you should be, let me pray for you. Father, we love you. And God, thanks for your word. Thanks that you love us enough that there are moments and passages in your word that don't just encourage us, but that challenge us. That your word, as the book of Hebrews tells us, is living and active, and it cuts into the things in our lives where we need to see you. Lord, I thank you for this word. And Lord, I stand with those who say, I don't wanna become spiritually lazy. I don't want to just float with the current. I don't want to just ride the escalator. God, I want to move forward in my walk with you. I want to believe that you're, you're, you're holding out better things in your kingdom for me. So Lord, help us to be aware of what your spirit wants to do in our hearts. Lord, and for the one who is putting faith in you today, there is a person or there is a circumstance where there is a moment that they are putting in your hands and saying, God, in this moment, I'm believing for better things. Lord, I'm trusting you with this right now. Holy Spirit, would you bring your grace and your assurance to them right now in this moment? And Lord, for the one who is weary and tired, and is saying, God, would you help me to be patient? I know you're not unjust. I know you're always at work. So God, I put this in your hands. Would you remind them of who you are and of your great love for us? Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would just blow through this place. Would you renew and refresh us in a way that only you can do? Lord, thanks for your word. Thanks for this time together. May we not just hear it, but may we listen and then live it out. As we go from here, would you send us out with your special favor and with your wonderful peace? And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for being here.
May the Lord favor you as you live out his word this week. We'll see you next Sunday.